Listen up, get ready, I'm not gonna take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up, get ready, we're not gonna sit back. Hello, everybody out there in uh, our listening and viewer land. This is Michael James with another edition of the Live from the Heartland show. This is being recorded on the 15th of February for the week of February 18th. And uh, we've got some really neat guests coming on today. We have our wonderful older woman, Maria Haddon, here in the 49th Ward, is going to give us a ward report. We're going to link up with my cousin, Adam James, out in California, who played football for Northwestern. And is quite the uh, analytical mind when it comes to sports, has a lot of information. And then our own Lynn Orman, uh, is back from her trip to the Grammys, and she will give us a little report. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, we talk about it being live from the heartland, and for newer listeners or newer viewers, we've been around for some 20-some-odd years, and we used to do the show from the stage at the Heartland Cafe. And at a certain point, WLUW, Loyola Station, asked us to actually host the show rather than someone from the college. And a number of us got involved. And uh, over the years, we did the show not only at the Heartland, we did it in the Red Line Tap, we did it at the No Exit Cafe. And then after Katie Hogan and I sold the Heartland, we moved it downtown. Uh, we did it from the WLUW studios. And then when we got the pandemic, we had to start doing it by a Zoom from home, which does allow us to do people from all over the world. So right now, I'm just going to tell you that you can get us uh, at WLUW uh, 88.7, WLUW.org, podcasts on YouTube and Spotify. And we are on Thursday nights at 9 o'clock, Channel 21 on Can TV. And uh, let me just say that a lot of people, a lot of interns, unpaid and then later paid, have helped to contribute to the blossoming of the show. Uh, those of you who watch it notice, uh, you know, on YouTube or Can TV, there's a lot of uh, visuals now. And I want to thank Emilio Davis, who, who started on that. And that project has been continued by Hal James. And um, we do have to pay these people. So you might want to contact me at fatback at AOL if you want to chip in. Enough said for now. That's what uh, I had to share. So one of the best things that happened to me to this week just was a little bit ago. I drove downtown with my old friend, David Orr. Uh, he's a retired guy. He used to be the Cook County clerk. Uh, he was the mayor of Chicago for a couple of days after the wonderful Harold Washington passed away. Uh, and David and I were going downtown because David was giving a talk along with Jan Schakowsky, our congresswoman, endorsing Chuy Garcia for mayor. And uh, I'm going to have Hal play a little clip of a few things that uh, Chewy said at that endorsement session. We're going to have friends and allies like these two individuals who will help guide us, who will inform us about how to move Chicago forward, how to bring a multiracial across the city coalition together and establish a solid basis of government in Chicago, one that responds to the needs of people in every neighborhood. Okay, uh, on a not so good front, uh, we have serious situation in Turkey and in Syria, not to mention Ukraine, Haiti, the Sudan, Peru, uh, in our own country here in the United States, the gun violence is out of control. So please pay attention to the news. I know it can be overwhelming. But uh, we need to know what's going on so that we can take positions when we need to. The president of Brazil showed up in the United States for a little visit. And before he met with the president, he met with Bernie Sanders and with the Progressive Caucus. Lula is quite a guy. He's a little bit like Bernie. And I got a report from Al Jazeera about something that he had promised. Brazil has uh, had a situation with illegal mining operations in the Amazon a lot of it on indigenous people's lands, and Lula, Luis Ignacio Lula de Silva. Uh, he's had clashes with wildcat gold miners. The, uh, the leaders of the Yanomami tribe blame illegal mining for malnutrition, for the spread of disease, and rising violence in Brazil's largest indigenous reservation. This is the worst moment of invasion since the reservation was established 30 years ago. 
Um, and this week, government agents destroyed illegal mining infrastructure and confiscated fuel and boats, a sharp reversal of former President Bolsonaro's policy of Amazon development, which the Yanomami people blame for the increased mining. Okay, that's a little bit of report from Brazil. Um, here at home, also on the indigenous people's front and on sovereign rights, up in Haywood, Wisconsin, the Lac du Flambeau Reservation, uh, natives there have blocked the roads that are running through the reservation uh, over the issue of who pays for the upkeep. Um, these roads bring white uh, residents who bought land uh, on one side of a lake near the reservation can only get there if they go through native lands. And apparently, um, according to the Black de Flambeau Reservation folks, uh, they are not meeting their responsibilities. Keep you posted on that. On the election front, uh, many of you who listen and watch this show know that we live in Chicago and we are active in Chicago. And in Chicago, we have another election coming up on the 28th. And that'll be a week from Tuesday. And there's a lot at stake. We uh, we need to, uh, we're going to elect a, a new mayor or keep the one we have. Uh, there's a lot of good candidates. Uh, it's getting a little acrimonious. I would rather people see the good that the others have done. But um, whoever you're for, it's really important to get out there and vote. And I would suggest that you look into, you can vote early, but you can wait till election day and you can get a lot of information out there if you're looking for it. You want to look in into the mayor's race. You want to look into the police district councils. And actually next week, it looks like we're going to have Chuy Garcia on and we're going to have Don Rose coming on again with his analysis. So I think that's enough for right now. Um, we're going to be right back with our first guest, Maria Haddon. So stay tuned here on the left end of your dial or wherever you may be finding the show, Live from the Heartland. We're here for you. Be right back. Listen up, get ready. I'm not going to take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up, get ready. We're not going to sit back. Hey, we're back. We're back with more live from the heartland for the week of February 18th. And once again, we are recording this on the 15th. And I'm really happy to bring on one of my favorite political people in the world. And that would be the one, the only. My older woman, Maria Haddon. Good morning to you. Good afternoon, it really is. And it's Good great afternoon. to have you here. Good afternoon. It is great to be here with you, Michael. I know you're working hard. There's a lot going on in our ward, in our city, and all around town. Uh, you uh, were elected almost four years ago. You beat a longtime incumbent. Um, and uh, you are now up for your first re-election campaign. You're actively involved with that. And one of the things that keeps coming up uh, from people who are both in support of you as well as people who are critical is the situation around the homeless encampment at Tui Park. And um, I myself have really thought you've been very transparent and open and done a lot of good things about it. It clearly irks some people. Give us a little bit of your thoughts on the Tui Park homeless issue and the broader homeless issue. Sure. Um, we're in a crisis. We have a lot of people who are experiencing homelessness right now. Um, while it's certainly um, always something that is impacting residents in our city, I think the past couple of years, um, economic hardship, pandemic, more economic hardship, uh, rising housing costs, those just a lot of factors. Um, have caused an increase in the number of people experiencing homelessness. Um, finding affordable housing is very difficult. There's not a day in my office that goes by where we're not having residents reach out to us about affordable housing issues. And so the problem of homelessness is something that's a city problem um, that we all should be involved in, in providing solutions to. And certainly as an elected official, that's one of my jobs. Um, I think that. Um, a lot of times when problems that are universal social problems um, show up in your backyard um, when you haven't had to deal with them before, it can cause a lot of tension. So I think our community has actually been really fantastic in, in coming through and 
uh, official and unofficial ways to provide support and assistance for our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, my office and the Department of Family and Support Services have worked really hard to find housing for people uh, because that is the solution, right, um, to people experiencing homelessness is to find them housing. And um, over this 18 months, we've matched 84 people with housing through rapid rehousing events. So I feel like we're in a good place. But um, as I've had conversations with neighbors, both in large group and public meetings and small groups and in my written communications, I think the important thing for people to realize is this isn't, um, um, there's no magic solution. Home, the problem of homelessness is not going away anytime soon. What we have to get better about are the, the funds, the resources, and the programs that we have available um, to help our constituents, um, one, hopefully avoid becoming homeless, but two, if they are experiencing homelessness, to find a, a swift path out of it. So it's going to continue to be um, an issue for our city and I imagine for our neighborhood in the coming years. Well, I, I hear a lot of discussion about it, and uh, you know, there's a lot of misinformation. I mean, I drive by there every day, and that, that encampment on Tui has really been very orderly and kind of a peaceful vibe. And I noticed uh, as recent as yesterday, there are very few of those tents left. It clearly, uh, it's sort of been clearing out. There was talk about turning that building that belonged to St. Francis Hospital across from the, the Jewel. Is that still in play for a, a, a place for residency for people? Yeah, so so it wasn't just talk. We had a, a very large in-depth community process about a uh, proposed shelter there. So Northside Housing, which has operated a shelter, a men's shelter specifically on the north side of the city for the past 40 years, is looking for a new home. They were forced out of their facility in December of 2021 due to landlord negligence. Um, in their facility in Uptown. So they had to leave that facility, find temporary housing for their clients um, for more than a year now, and had been looking for a new home. So with uh, more than 70% of our residents surveyed, and that was like over 1,200 people in support of it, um, it is part of a key social network we need in order to help people come out of homelessness. So their shelter um, will be for around 70 people um, they serve men experiencing homelessness, and it's a residential facility where uh, average client stays about 80 days. Um, so there are different types of shelters throughout the city. Um, there are insufficient spaces. This won't be a shelter that, hey, someone experiencing homelessness like right now, right, living unsheltered can just like get a spot in right away. Um, but it is part of our larger system of helping people to come out of homelessness. Um, so the other thing the city's doing is um, purchasing a few of the motels over on Lincoln Avenue in the 40th Ward to increase the space uh, available that nonprofits in the city have in order to provide housing for people who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, thank you for sharing that. That's good information, and I'll certainly spread the news on that. Any yeah. timeline on that uh, building up there on Clark? Um, we've actually got a big meeting on Friday. So the, the process that we had was to, you know, get community support because they need a special use permit. Now, a special use permit is granted and goes uh, under the Zoning Board of Appeals. So they're in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals this Friday. Um, and so um, we've got, you know, some folks coming to speak in support of it. We've submitted all the information from our community process as well. And should they gain the approval from the Zoning Board of Appeals, they'll be able to move forward with their uh, purchase and construction. They think June, they'll be open. So we've also, if everyone's ever interested in anything related to any development process that we've had, um, you can find it on the website, 49thward.org. Um, there is a tab that says development proposals. You can look at past development proposals, current proposals, see all the data, the survey results, um, all the updates that we put there. So um, yeah, so that one, hopefully everything goes well on Friday and we're able to, um, you know, do our part in the 49th Ward to uh, continue to provide more options for people experiencing homelessness throughout the city. I'll be checking out the progress as I hit the McGawai and Evanston in the mornings for a swim. Uh, I love driving up Clark on my way to doing that, checking out the neighborhood. Uh, Maria Haddon, in addition or beyond the homelessness encampment and those questions, what issue, what topic have you had the most pushback on 
and how have you responded or how might you respond? Um, that's a big one. And, and you touched on the shelter already. There's a small percentage of people who were really strongly against the, the shelter being located there. Um, you know, from our survey, like I said, we had like 72% in support. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I get strong pushback on. Um, um, sometimes I don't get strong pushback on a lot, I guess I'll say. The Tui Park and the, and the shelter are probably the biggest things. Some of the things people um, question, it's hard to um, give, I'll say, I'll, I'm careful not to give credence to misinformation. There's a lot of people pushing a lot of misinformation, I'll say even around development maybe. Um, and that's a, a good topic to talk about. There's a handful of people, mainly in the real estate industry, um, who've been pretty vocal about how, oh, Maria hadn't, you know, cancels all these developments and, you know, doesn't let development go forward. And um, it's really unfortunate that people have to resort to um, misinformation um in order to to try and prove a point but i'll say we've got a really great community development process um, in the 49th ward you can also find that on our web page and while we're not a ward that has a ton of available space um, for new construction so like we're not like a 47th ward um, um, or like a first ward where you're going to see a lot of new developments um, but we um, are seeing a lot of building rehabs and then we've got two exciting proposals at Howard and Polina and Howard and Ashland that people should check out on the website. Howard and Polina has proposed about 110 units of affordable housing, brand new commercial space, um, looking to preserve that uh, historic Warner building and, and bring some beautiful new construction and an equitable transit-oriented development project um, right to Howard Street next to the Red Line. So likely have some community meetings on that starting in April as the, the owners of that space and the developers of that project get some uh, through uh, some of their city hurdles. And then uh, we've been working for a couple of years, uh, both through first the community process and now through a bit of process with the city for the two city-owned lots, or only two publicly owned lots at Howard and Ashton, where the Peterson Garden is right now, or the Hello Howard Garden, um, where we're looking to build some uh, 30 to 40 units of new affordable uh, home ownership opportunities with a new low equity co-op. Um, so, you know, we don't have a ton of opportunity for building new things, um, but I've been focused a lot on uh, building quality lasting projects that are really meeting the needs of uh, 49th Ward residents. Well, thanks for sharing that. And I, uh, I do appreciate how I get you to come on and give a little tour of talking about the neighborhood. And I'm sure we'll have you back and you'll keep us posted. Uh, a couple of things that have come up, you know, there is a, uh, it was a medical marijuana facility. I think it's called Zen Leaf, uh, and it's on Rogers, I believe. Uh, yes. And it's, uh, I was in there once, I confess, um, checking it out. And uh, I'm wondering, there's talk about relocating that. Anything on that? Yeah. So, uh, again, that was um, um, one of our, one of our larger community meetings that was attended. Um, so um, it's called Zenleaf. Um, uh, Verano Holdings um, owns Zenleaf. And so it was the Green Gate Dispensary. It was a medicinal um, dispensary. Um, but when uh, recreational licenses were, became available, they were automatically granted to people who already had medicinal licenses. So the initial uh, individual owner sold to Verano Holdings, and it's now Zenleaf. So they've been looking for another location since they purchased that space. Um, you know, the original dispensary really catered to kind of just folks in the neighborhood. Um, Zenleaf is one of the biggest brands, um, and they like to think of themselves as the Apple store of cannabis uh, products. So I haven't been to one of their stores yet. But um, so they want to keep a location in Rogers Park, but they need a bigger space and a few other needs, mainly access to a lot of parking and access to, they want a location near um, kind of high areas of vehicle transit. So they initially had their eyes on the old Leona site. Um, so over at Sheridan and more. So uh, we went through a whole community process because they would require a zoning change um, for that location. Um, but through community feedback and ultimately um, after that multi hundred person community meeting, 
we had another local uh, locally owned business that expressed an interest in the Leona site. Um, and so I declined to approve their zoning permit um, at that time. So um, for those who have not been uh, aware of some of these uh, neighborhood happenings, um, it's JB Albertos who expressed an interest in the Leona site to purchase yeah. it, rehab it, do a fast casual space. So there's still some interest there. The owner currently says he doesn't want to sell his space. He's um, uh, uh, giving it in kind to an aldermanic candidate um, who's been using it as his campaign office for a few months, and that's a whole other story. But we looked, I'm not for, going there. <laughs> we looked for locations for um, for Zenleaf. Um, so there's uh, pretty tight zoning restrictions in the city of Chicago for cannabis dispensaries. So you can't just set up anywhere. Um, and there were, were very few locations in our ward um, that were kind of meeting their needs, but also meeting the city criteria. One of the first places before they selected Leona's um, that we really kind of tried to push them to was actually the Gateway Center. So the big shopping center at Howard and Clark with the Jewel and a bunch of other spaces. Um, it's kind of like the one space where you find a few more of the kind of corporate or franchise um, uh, businesses in the 49th Ward. It also is right there at the Howard Red Line stop. It's at Clark and Howard. You get Evanston traffic as well, and there's plenty of parking. Um, so um, they finally came back around and are actually looking at a location at the Gateway Center. So what used to be the Diamond Room um, for a short while, the Ethiopian oh, yeah. Diamond, it's just the space just north of Aspen Dental. Um, so they are uh, submitting some language. They don't need a zoning change. They'll have to do an amendment to the plan development. So that project is a plan development or PD. Um, so there'll have to be a text amendment to that to add the use of cannabis dispensary in order for them to lease the space. So we'll be bringing that to folks, um, I think at our March town hall. Um, so we likely won't go through a whole other community process. We have a ton of data where People were really supportive of the dispensary, um, but um, wanted a different location. I think this will provide a, a solution for everybody. Oh, that sounds good. Um, and we don't know any more about Leona's site. I mean, I I, I think I was talking to people at uh, JB Alberto's, and he had told me that it really wasn't uh, going to work out. Um, you know, me, I have always think about opening another place, but at 81, I'm not going to do it. I promise. Um, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping the, um, so the space has been vacant of a tenant for like six years now. Um, so it's been vacant since before I came in. And at one point, the current owner, um, before I was even sworn into office technically, but after I'd won the election, he came talking about wanting to do some kind of high rise development. So I'm not, I'm not sure what his initial intentions were when he bought the, the space, but um, we've had um, nearly a half dozen local people interested in leasing or buying that space but his he hasn't budged on his price um there's been a lot of barriers he's he's kind of put in the way so i'm hoping that maybe with some um changing times maybe he'll change his mind um become more amenable but people have wanted to do an event space people have wanted to do a uh, cidery um people have wanted to do restaurants so um it's a coveted location um i hope that he you know, after six years of it being vacant and doing nothing with it, I hope that, um, you know, he's able to find a tenant or a buyer um, that would benefit our community. Uh, that'd be great. Um, uh, let me uh, ask about lead pipes. Someone brought up lead pipes. I know that uh, there's people in the neighborhood checking on pipes. Uh, some company, I don't know, is out of Texas, uh, but they were in my backyard. And what's going on with lead pipes in our in our neighborhood? Um, I don't know about this company in from Texas. Um, it could I, from anywhere. It could I, I can no I problem. can tell you that one, um, 20, 24, 7, 365, if you're worried and want to check, we have free lead testing kits. You can call 311 or go through the website and get a free lead testing kit. Um, 2023 finally starts the city's efforts of kind of mass lead service line replacement, though. So every new... Um, water re main replacement project and sewer main replacement project that's been kind of planned out for this year going forward will also include 
um, free lead service line replacement for um, building owners and homeowners in that area. So we've got um, we've got the project at Howard and uh, excuse me at Ashland and Birchwood and kind of Rogers right now. That project was slated um, last year. It was supposed to start last summer, so that project won't include it. But we have two more big water projects in our ward this year, and when those projects get kicked off, they have included in the cost of the project free lead service line replacement. So I think um, from all of the kind of capital money we've put towards it, um, we're going to finally see more of the lead service line replacement happening um, in homes around the city. That sounds good. Mm -hmm. uh, Maria Haddon, let me ask you about police community relations. We have a, this election coming up on the 28th, and one of the most important things besides electing a mayor and other officials is this new police um, district councils or police oversight or yeah. community control of the police. I mean, we're really moving in a good direction. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, uh, I, you know, there isn't enough talk, I don't feel, about it uh, anywhere about that aspect of the election, but just in general, how are police community relations in our ward? Um, I, I think they're pretty good, at least with uh, my office. Um, we have pretty low attendance at CAPS meetings. So I think one of the, one of the challenges that we're really hoping um, the district council uh, electeds can do is to create those spaces for community police engagement. So you can, um, the last CAPS meeting I was at, there was like two people, right? So a lot of people don't come to CAPS meetings, but CAPS meetings aren't the way they used to be 20 years ago. There's not um, a lot of information exchange um, because there's, there's, it's not allowed to, right? Um, so there's some, some challenges with the structure of the of the CAPS program right now that I think make a lot of people feel like, you know, they can go and share some information. Um, police can go and share some information, but that's that's pretty much it. Um, what we um, see in our district is uh, we have a very active kind of community policing program. They do a lot of activities, outreach to the high schools and youth programs. Um, but unless you're completely tapped into that, there, there's no kind of other real space. Like when we get to discussions about police policies or, um, you know, police staffing, right? Um, kind of things, things like that, that I think I get a lot of questions on or that come down to impacting the service delivery in our area. There haven't been spaces for that. And that's what we're looking to see with these new district council members, elected officials, um, who can build these additional bridges and spaces um, so that constituents uh, can talk more with our police. And hopefully that the goal is we have better services. That is good. Um, Maria Han, let me ask you a little bit about uh, our schools and our treasured parks. We, uh, we are the location of a big chunk of Chicago's uh, lakefront with the Great Lake Michigan. Uh, we have a beautiful park up here, Loyola Park. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything you wanna share about schools and our parks? Um, our schools are doing really great. Um, I'll say, if you guys haven't seen it yet, um, we've got um, two really cool Black History Month um, activities coming up. Um, so one um, is actually at Eugene Field. So on Thursday, the 23rd, at 4 p.m. Um, we've got a post on it on, on my Facebook page, you can register. But uh, uh, Sherman Dilla Thomas is gonna be a guest speaker, um, kind of historian, uh, Chicago historian, uh, to come and talk with students and community members um, at Eugene Field. Um, so that's pretty cool. Our schools are always doing, um, I think, pretty great programs and projects like that, offering opportunities for, um, even if you don't have kids, right? For you to for you to come in, um, and then we've got um, a great annual Black History Month assembly um, taking place. February twenty sixth at twelve thirty at the Loyola Park Fieldhouse. Spring programming will be starting in the parks pretty soon as well. And so, whether it's a park near you um, or another park in our ward, I would encourage people um, to check out the Park District's website. Um, check out uh, we have a School Shine in Forty Nine section in the newsletter. So if you're ever curious what's going on in the schools, um, there's a lot of good stuff. Um, and they're always looking for volunteers, I will say, 
And so if you uh, have some free time on your hands, um, they're both good places to tap into. Uh, when I was coming back from this uh, press conference where uh, David Orr came out and Jan Tchaikovsky came out for Chewy, I went to get on the L and um, the escalator was not working and there was just a line of young people coming up the stairs and all of a sudden I realized they were from Sen High School. So I had a little bit of a nice little dialogue and talked about you and uh, all that kind of thing. What is the best part of your job, Maria? Oh, let's see. There are a lot of good parts. Um, anything where I get to just engage with people um, directly, in person, really. Um, uh, the last couple of weeks, I've had a few visits at just some of our independent living senior homes where I'll tell you guys, you heard it here first. This week, I committed to this year or next planning a senior dance. Um, uh, yeah. I'm yeah. So, uh, the folks over at Natalie Salmon House do the jitterbug. are willing to host, um, jitterbug is too old for you, Michael. Nice try. <laughs> nice try. Um, but getting to engage with people like, you know, we're not always the source of, of programming. Um, but I get to participate and, and highlight different programming and doing things where I get to add to our community building um knitting our social fabric together um getting to actually fulfill people's requests um sometimes that actually happens like i can things work and we can solve little problems that's probably the best part well you're doing a good job and i just want to say i love you i do and i really appreciate the work you're doing Thank and you. uh i'm rooting for you in this next election and uh it won't be long we'll have you right back on the show won't be long thank you so much michael I Thank appreciate you, Maria Haddon. And all you people listening or watching, we'll be right back. We're going to take a short musical break, and we're coming back with uh, my cousin who played football at Northwestern and is quite a, a sports uh, information kind of a guy. And we'll be right back with that. And then we're going to have Lynn Orman coming on and talking about her little visit to the West Coast for the Grammys. Stay tuned here on the left end of your dial. Listen up. Get ready. I'm not going to take no more. That's a revolution. A revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up, get ready, we're not gonna sit back. We're back. We're back with more live from the Heartland for the week of the 18th of February. And we are recording on the 15th. And uh, you know, going toward the end of the show, we put the sports section at the back, and that's what we're gonna do now. I've got my cousin Adam James on. He's out there in California. Uh, he played football at Northwestern. He quite, was quite a jock, this guy. And he uh, moved to California. He's been a trainer for a long time. And he's now working in a movie. Uh, tell us a little bit about that movie before we do the sports. Doc Savage. Yes, Doc Savage. Um, thank you so much. It's great to be here, Michael. I really appreciate it. Of course, to everybody there in Chicago and the heartland, love you all. I hope everything's going great. Stay warm. Um, yes, yeah, so Doc Savage is a new web series um, that's going to be coming out on Roku, uh, Tubi, Freebie, and a few other streaming platforms. It's based um, or inspired by the original 1930s Pulp Fiction character, Doc Savage. He's a scientist, uh, adventurer, detective, and martial artist. And what we've done is we've kind of brought him into the modern era. Um, he was, in the 1930s, one of the most popular uh, characters in all of um, pulp, uh, popular culture. A very successful Pulp Fiction character, along with The Shadow. And uh, they did a movie in the 1970s starring uh, Ron Ellie, who had played Tarzan in the Tarzan television series. And uh, it just hadn't gotten the traction over the years, like Batman and Superman and, and some of the other superhero characters. But many people consider Doc Savage the original American superhero. And so we're doing a brand new web series based on this character, um, along with his team of, of experts. They take on an international evil mastermind. And um, it's really cool little project. Uh, we filmed the first episode up in Fresno, California. We're doing a sneak preview, little mini premiere of uh, the series, just showing episode one um, in a raw cut form <laughs> at the Martial Arts History Museum on March 11th, which is located in Burbank, California, part of the greater Los Angeles area. So for any of you out there who are listening, who are in uh, Southern California, the premiere will be at the Martial Arts History Museum on March 11th. And Come on over if you're in Southern California and want to see a cool uh, 
episode. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing this, Adam. And you and I worked in some of Andy Davis's movies together. And this yeah. is a SAG Screen Actors Guild movie. So uh, we're standing with the union. Okay, this is a sports report. So besides Doc Savage rescuing the world or whatever, let's talk. One of the big things that led me to call you was you had texted me and said, hey, Northwestern's playing Purdue right now. And then I learned later, I didn't go see it, and that Northwestern beat number one Purdue. Give us yep. the sports report start with Purdue losing to Northwestern. Well, yes, it's a really great story for Chicago sports fans. Um, the Northwestern basketball team has been on upward uh, trajectory with uh, coach Chris Collins, who was Doug Collins' son. Uh, he was the former Chicago Bulls coach. And uh, Chris Collins done a great job, got him to the tournament four years ago. They kind of lost a little bit of that momentum last two years, but this year's team is really playing well. They've got some great players. And yes, they just played um, ranked Purdue at home. Huge win. Um, some people call it an upset for us Wildcats. It was it was uh, how it was supposed to end. <laughs> and we stormed the court and, and, uh, and celebrated with the team. So that was exciting. A lot of great things happening for Northwestern sports. Um, of course, there is talk of a remodeling of Ryan Field, uh, the Northwestern football team's uh, stadium. And uh, it is the, the project will become it, it is designed to become one of the best uh, facilities in all of the country for in person game day experience, up to date modern technology, all the great uh, amenities will be at this little stadium. It's also going to be smaller than any other stadium in the Big Ten Conference and one of the smallest in the country, but they're hoping to make it a more intimate experience, highlighting all those things that make Northwestern and its athletic program special. And they'll still be right next to Mustard's Last Stand. Where right. You can get a Chicago-style hot dog, and they will give you a ketchup if you want it. Okay. That's right. Uh, how about uh, women's rankings? I, I think there are five Big Ten teams in the top 16. That is correct. The Big Ten Conference continues to do extremely well, academically, of course, but also athletically. And the women's programs have just continued to uh, get stronger and better, perform better. Uh, a lot of exciting things happening for women's uh, sports and women's basketball, and, and of course, with the uh, entire college basketball scene getting ready to go to the postseason conference championships in both men's and women's, and then the national tournaments, should be a really great time for sports fans this spring. So we've got March Madness coming. How long will that last? And uh, you got any prediction on who will win it all? It now goes into April Madness. Um, but yeah, we're, we're hoping for a really great tournament again this year. Each year, you always get these amazing upsets. Uh, that's what makes it so fun and exciting. So, um, on the pro basketball front, in the women's sector, the WNBA, there's been a lot of trading, bolstering the positions of both Las Vegas and New York. Um, and LeBron broke the record on scoring. Michael Jordan's turning 60. Yes. <laughs> yes, there's some monumental moments that just happened in basketball. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, not only one of the great basketball players of history, many people say the greatest, but more importantly, a great human being, a great activist, uh, a great thinker, writer. Um, and uh, he, of course, held that that uh, that position as all-time leading scorer for four decades. He broke Will Chamberlain's record, and now LeBron has passed his. A worthy successor, uh, LeBron has been a phenomenal player, great professional, uh, wishing him all the success. And, of course, Michael Jordan, uh, who many people consider better than both Kareem and, and LeBron, uh, is about to have his 60th birthday. And uh, he did a very, he's doing a very generous thing. He's making the largest individual contribution or donation to the Make-A-Wish Foundation, $10 million. Um, just going to show that those people who achieve greatness, when they pay it forward and they pay it back to the community, makes a huge impact. So thank you, Michael. That's, that's good. All right, so golf. I don't follow golf a lot. Uh, I do like watching it, though. And, you know, during the Tiger Wood time that I was always paying close attention, it was exciting. Um, yes. I, I do enjoy watching it, but there's some big controversy going on in golf between uh, different associations. What can you tell us about that? Well, essentially, there's you know one major association, um, and uh, this this golf association has done incredibly well, PGA um, for the men's, and then um, they've done very very well. They've grown over the years. It's kind of like the NFL and the NBA. It's got a, an established record. There's a new golf tournament that is funded by the Saudi Arabian um, uh, fund. And uh, many people have uh, you know, concerns about the money, where it's coming from, whether or not Saudi Arabia as a nation is using this, uh, this sponsorship in order to affiliate itself with a very uh, wonderful, culturally important 
popular sport. Um, and the men and women that play that are men in this case with this tournament, the Live LIV tournament. Um, and so as a result, there are a lot of people who are concerned about this tournament and this, this organization. Others think it's a great thing. Uh, competition is important. And uh, not having and controlling all men's professional golf uh, has some people saying, hey, this is good, good for, good for um, you know, the growth of the sport. Uh, we'll see. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out in the end, whether this tournament can even get traction. There's some aspects of it that make real sports fans less intrigued. Uh, it's not nearly the same tournament level as the PGA as far as the number of rounds and what you need to do in order to make the cut. The Adam, doesn't James, cut. Adam James, we're going to, uh, uh, I'm just going to let everyone know the baseball opens, uh, the spring training starting pretty quickly and the White Sox open against Houston on March 30th. Uh, let's go to the Olympics because one of the things that there's all these controversy whether the, uh, you know, athletes can perform unaligned to a country. And the other thing that's come up is maybe getting rid of boxing. So address those two things. Well, yes. Um, you know, the last Olympics was a perfect example. Um, during this last Olympics, Russia had started its its invasion and the Russian athletes were not allowed to um, participate, but they did. And they did it under the International Olympic Committee uh, banner, but still they had the opportunity to compete, which is good for the athletes. Bad for the message as far as holding an authoritarian regime accountable for its atrocities and um, not allowing them to get, you know, good publicity, good public relations marketing, so to speak, um, by their athletes in these type of international competitions. So it's a lot of people who think that they should be allowed to compete, whether it's uh, tennis players in the tennis tournaments or Olympic athletes, let the athletes play. Um, but others feel that, no, we have to hold these countries uh, accountable for what they're doing. Do I'm sports. holding up a little uh, bumper sticker, do sports, not war, uh, uh, athletes United, United for peace. <laughs> now with boxing, you know, boxing itself is a controversial sport. Many people are not fans of boxing and MMA. I am, love it, love the sports, um, love the athletes. Some people have concerns, but boxing in particular has a long history of involvement with the Olympics, but it's possibly gonna come to an end, at least temporarily, maybe forever. Um, because of some of the political aspects, speaking of you know, not doing war. Um, one of the, the, the amateur um, body that controls, uh, the body that controls the amateur sport of boxing, um, they are based in Switzerland, but their major sponsor is a Russian energy company. So they recently made the decision to allow, not only for the athletes of Belarus and Russia to participate in the um, uh, international championships, but to also have their flags and national anthems played if they win, um, as a result, the United States of America, Ireland, and Great Britain are all boycotting these tournaments. They're saying, no, if you're going to allow that, we won't participate. Um, also, there's been a lot of concerns about the judges and the fairness and how that's un uh, fold unfolded over the years. Of course, there's horrible stories of tremendous athletes being denied their, their victory, like Roy Jones Jr., um, because of unfair judging. Um, and recently, the International Olympic Committee gave some very specific pushback to the um, International Boxing Association in regards to how their, their rules are set up. And the IOC was basically saying, in order for you to be recognized as an amateur sport in our arena, in the Olympics, you're gonna have to make these changes. And the International Boxing Association said, no thanks. So <laughs> we'll see what happens, but it looks like it's not gonna happen. Um, We'll, we'll see. Right now, it's not on the list for sports at the 28. Well, I, I got to say that I, I do like boxing, although as I get older, sometimes it's just too gruesome. Uh, but your uncle, my dad, uh, was in advertising, and one of his accounts was Philly Cigars, and he produced the International Boxing Commission Saturday Night Fights on ABC. So I grew up, uh, you know, knowing a lot about boxing. And uh, actually went to a great uh, a match between Kid Gavilan and Bobo Olson. Uh, followed the jet Airstream trailer with the TV crew in the 50s up to Boston. So we'll talk more about boxing. We're going to run out of time here for our little sports segment and family segment on Live from the Heartland. And uh, I'll see you at the family Zoom. Because one of the best things about the pandemic was that cre your, your dad... My Uncle David created a family Zoom with all of his kids and with my sister and myself, and who knows what members of the family join up. So I'll see you on Sunday, Adam. Outstanding. Thanks for having me. Have see a wonderful you. day. Bye.
And stay tuned. We'll be right back with more Life from the Heartland. Our music producer, Lynn Orman, is coming on. She's going to give us a little update on the Grammys. Be right back here on the left end of your dial. WLUW 88.7, Chicago Sound Alliance. Listen up. Get ready. I'm not going to take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up. Get ready. We're not going to sit back. Hey, we're back. We're back with the Live from the Heartland show for the week of February 18th. And uh, it's really neat to bring on Lynn Orman, who has brought us so much great music. And I know she disappeared in the past week, and she went, I think, to California to cover the Grammys. So we're having a Grammy report right now. How about it? And you are a grandmother, too. But I'm a gra- <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I went from the, from the Grammys to being, I dove right in. I got in, I took the red eye, got in at 5.30 a.m., slept for five hours. The the flight, United flight, was packed with performers leaving L.A., like Wayne Baker Brooks and Damon Ranger and Heather Blaze. Everybody was on my flight, my son, my daughter-in-law. And um, I slept for five hours and jumped right into being a Grammy. Grandma, that is. <laughs> I understand. In Rogers so, Park. <laughs> how was that trip out there to the West Coast? And oh my God. Who won and who do we, who's been on our show? How did they do? Give us a report. Well, here's my takeaway. And as of coming home, I really thought to myself, okay, from now on, some of those red carpet interviews and stuff, I'm going to do them and edit them and get them to you so we can have some behind the scenes red carpet reports with some artists. I mean, some of the most memorable things for me, well, at the show was Cheryl Crow, Bonnie Ray, and Mick Fleetwood, who did an unbelievable tribute to Christy McPhee. That was one of the highlights for me. I mean, it was just really beautiful. They did a tribute to, um, you know, her song, um, from Rumors, I think it was Songbird, which is one of my absolute favorites and really a beautiful moment. But the other beautiful moment was, if you've seen some of the reports, some unknown blues artist, female, older woman took Song of the Year. How could that be? How could somebody win over Taylor Swift and Adele? and um, and Harry Styles, how could that be? And she won, Bonnie Raitt won for Just Like That. And it's become a number one Billboard hit, her second only number one Billboard hit, if you remember, um, in the nick of, in nick of Time was the other one that won. But it was so beautiful, Michael. To me, sitting in the second row watching the premiere telecast, which is the preview, that if you log on, you could still watch it. It's um, it's live.grammy.com. And it was just this poetic moment because Judy Collins was the one that was giving out the Grammy and she gave it to Bonnie Ray. It was just really sweet. She was visibly very um, humbled and um, excited. She won three awards. She also won for Best Americana Performance. She gave a nod to the Americana category for all this inclusiveness, which was wonderful, for uh, Made Up My Mind. And, um, you know, she just beat out Adele and Lizzo and Swift and a number of people. And um, she's won 13 Grammys now, and she's been nominated 30 times. But I just wanted to share something really quick. Um, She sent me a note after the shoot-up and the massacre in Highland Park. And um, I went to her concert and her record company made sure that she sent a note that we could share with everybody. And she says, let's keep living for the ones who didn't make it by working to heal the rifts between us and enacting wiser policies for safer guns and mental health with remembrance, Bonnie. And um, I'll send you a copy of it, but I've got this beautiful note that she sent me so just very much a um a wonderful humanitarian the other wonderful maybe i would say some people would say it was an upset was edgar winter edgar winter won for his album brother johnny which was a tribute to his brother 
and had all kinds of fabulous artists on it. Bobby Rush, um, Joe Bonamassa, uh, the last performance of Taylor Hawkins, you know, the drummer from Dave Grohl's band. Um, some really amazing, amazing, uh, amazing CD recording. And he actually said, it was very weird because he, all of a sudden this white haired man with sunglasses and his record company exec sat right next to me at the Grammys. So that was exciting. Um, the other one, which I think is very respectable and exciting, and I'd love to have him on our show, is Jay Ivey. Jay Ivey won for best spoken word for poetry, a brand new category. And um, the poet that sat by the door, he is a Chicago homeboy, went to high school here and said, he was inspired by his English teacher in high school. Um, he's been on records with Kanye. He actually on this record is John Legend, which he professes. He gave him the name Legend, which is great. But Jay Ivey, if you could catch him, he is fantastic. My other all-time favorite that is not televised but was on the premiere was Boo Mitchell and Martin Shore one for an album called Stomping Ground from their um, documentary called Take Me to the River, which featured New Orleans music. I We've had Bobby Rush on. And I Bobby Rush- that, Just that line, take me to the river and wash me down. Oh my God, Michael, you have to, we're gonna have to share Stomping Ground. Um, it's with Aaron Neville and the Dirty um, Dozen ba Brass Band. And uh, Boo is, you know, uh, Grammy winning producer and they won as well as the movie won for, I think it's called The History of New Orleans, which is a tip of the hat to, you know, from Quint Davis to George Wayne, who started the Newport Jazz Festival and the Folk Festival. But I this went is to the Newport Jazz Festival in my youth. 1961, I think I went. Do you? Did you really? You have photos? I hung out, I hung out on the beach with Horace Silver and Ola Tunji. And, uh, you know, Horace Silver was from Norwalk, Connecticut, and his he went to church <laughs> at my adopted brother's. His mom was the teacher. And um, also Ola Tunji, I would, then brought to Lake Forest College. No uh, kidding. I was with Don Law, whose father was a heavy hitter in Columbia Records. Uh, and this would have been the uh, summer of 61. Yeah, Anyhow, so back to the, honey, any, any Chicago winners? Was Is Ivy from Chicago? Well, uh, we didn't, they did not win the children's um, best album, but to me, that was the best album in the children's category. Um, Ivy and WB and Wendy Morgan for yeah. that album on Into the Little Blue House with all the blues players is, Extraordinary, but the Alphabet Rockers won. I held a breakfast Saturday morning before the nominees party, which I started this 30 years ago, Michael. I only had like six people there. This year, there were 75. And the remarkable thing, and I want to give another tip of my hat to Harvey, Harvey Mason Jr. He has really worked hard as the CEO and president of the Grammys to have more diversity and inclusion. And um, it's been wonderful. Divinity Rocks, I mean, Falu, an Indian artist, won last year. Um, so that's been great. And if you saw the show, anybody out there, you know, Lizzo, she is really all about women and embracing your beauty, no matter what size you are, which was really a wonderful statement for people that are, you know, that really, um, you know, want to keep that alive and, I mean, keep it important as an important, um, it's something very important as we move into, you know, new grounds. Also, uh, Brandi Carlisle, she won for Best Rock Album, which surprised the crap out of her. Um, it was really, I mean, over... <laughs> Over Jeff Beck, and speaking of which, okay, I'll tell you my one my one vote of right. contention. Buddy Guy didn't win, uh, but respectfully, Taj Mahal and Ry Cooter walked away with Best Traditional Album, which was joyful. I mean, Buddy has eight, but 
but he opened the um the ceremony the premier ceremony with the blind boys of alabama and uh, yeah. that was really incredible and shoshana bean but he only had two minutes on stage how wonderful would it have been if they would have put buddy guy on the live broadcast with a tribute to jeff beck would have been great right so that's my only faux pas well, this has been a great report. I have more enthusiasm for the Grammys. I've never really gotten into watching them, but uh, I certainly like your report, and I know I'll listen to that and watch it a few times in the course of looking at this show. And uh, next year, I'll be paying really close attention to the Grammys. Well, I think it's really important that people know, and probably with the other organizations as well, that it's not only about the live broadcast that they help musicians in need, down on their luck, um, addiction, mental health issues. So, you know, there's a lot more education. So I'm happy to come on and give that a report anytime. And it's delightful to be with you. Well, I keep working with you, booking music for this show. Thanks, Lynn. And I'm looking forward Thank to a, a night when we go out and hear some music. I'm an old guy, but I vow to go out and see more live music. Okay. Let's do it. Thanks. We want to thank everybody who makes this show possible. We want to thank Lynn Orman, Katie Hogan, Tom Clark, Hal James. Uh, and we'll be back next week. And so far, we have commitments from Don Rose to give us a, a little bit of analysis leading up to the election. And as of this morning, when I talked to Chuy Garcia and people, he's coming on too. So we'll be back next week with more Live from the Heartland. You can listen to us on WLUW 88.7. It gets streamed there, too. That's on Saturday mornings. You can always get it at YouTube.com slash Heartland Media. And now it's on Can TV on Thursday nights, Channel 21 at 9 o'clock. We'll be back next week. Keep doing good in the world. The world needs all the good that you do, that I do, that Lynn does, that Hal does, that all of us do. All power to the people. Have a great week. And don't forget, do sports, not war. Are you doing the best you can? a dream awaiting I can see it in your eye it may not come easy but you know you've got a friend I'll be by your side the entire ride just let me hear you say amen are you doing doing are you doing the best you can Tell me how you do it.